Warning, the following series explores an alternative view on controversial topics, including race, religion, and history. While the material may be controversial, the evidence presented is compelling and supported by extensive research. We caution that this series includes revelations that may be eye-opening, and is not intended for viewers who are not prepared to question their beliefs or perception of reality. This series also contains legitimate and significant revelations that may spoil the ancient stone mystery. Keep in mind that the information presented is not necessarily fact, but rather a perspective or idea backed by solid and overwhelming evidence. While we do not claim that the information presented in this series is 100% factual, the evidence speaks for itself. So we urge viewers to please approach the material with an open mind, and consider the potential impact it may have on their personal beliefs and worldview. Previously, on Kyle Knows It All. Okay, so what is the mystery that we're solving, or what is the debate? There's an ancient mystery that resides on this planet, so unique that it stands out amongst all the other mysteries. Melted and molded rocks, with no known technology of how this was done, and indicate a level of skill we're not aware of today, and can only be considered advanced technology. When? How? What? Where? Why? When? What? Who? Where? Why? What? When? How? What? Who? What? Where? Why? How? When? What? Who? Where? What? How? Why? When? Who? What? You know what I mean? So, let's say that my theories and my ideas are totally just wrong. So whether it's the answer or not, they are at least an answer that makes it possible. Oswald and Corey, and they see all these stone melted marks. There, what's their best explanation for those things? You hear all sorts of things. They had a rock softener. Magnetism. It was the gods. It was the levitation technology. or It was sound. I'm going to come in with a third option. The melting point of granite is lowered drastically if introduced to water. When the floods happened, the Oswan Corey is underwater. <laughs> Boop! Who built those stone things 12,000 years ago? The Egyptians. How and why did they have laser cutting technology? They didn't. They used a magnifying glass in the sun. That's the beam of high concentrated heat laser evidence that you see everywhere around the world. That's, it was the sun. Next question. How is that possible? Okay, <laughs> you get a big enough magnifying glass lens and it can melt anything. Boop! So like, holy crap, I'm gonna harness that. I'm gonna rule the world. And then they just did. So, the little things. And so where's my evidence for that? Okay, well, here we go. <laughs> you know, strap it. Okay, cause I, you know, I actually have plenty. Let's go. So I realized something kind of funny the other day. When I say that I totally know the answer behind all these stone things. You want to know why you should believe me? Because nobody says that. Nobody just says, oh, I know the answers. Everybody's always like, oh, aliens, or oh, this. Like, everybody's always bamboozled by it. Everybody always has theories. Everybody always proposes some idea. But nobody ever is just like, this is the answer. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so it's funny because I realized the other day when I was watching parts of this documentary again, I was like, you know, they say everything so matter-of-factly. And then I thought, you know, nobody ever just does that, though. Because I've seen a million of these pyramid theories, and they always say, oh, maybe it was this, or maybe it was done like this, or, oh, potentially they had this, or, oh, it's possible they could have done this. Nobody just ever says, hey, I figured it out. They did this. Nobody just claimed that they have the real answer, you know what I mean? Because that's what's different about this documentary. They're just like, people think that this happened, but it's this. And this is proof of this. And it's just so funny because it, it just like slaps you with the truth and violates you with reality. <laughs> yeah. But and I was like, so maybe I should straight up say that I have the answers. People would just be like, oh, finally. Somebody at least claims that they have got it all figured out. That they have the real answer. That's why nobody ever says, I for sure figured it out. Because you can't say that if you didn't, right? Because somebody can always just poke holes. You know, if you have the truth... The truth is protected in a shield of reality and some sort of evidence. And so it's interesting to think about that, that if you have lies, whether on purpose or not, they can get holes blown in them. So it's like eventually you'll realize that you'll hit a dead end if you're not following the truth. So it's just funny because this documentary is just like, it was this. They straight up just say, this is how this was made. This was done this way. And they just literally just break down everything. Like, oh yeah, this isn't even a secret. They wrote this down in hieroglyphics. You just don't know, because... And that's another thing I like. They just say, you don't know what's possible. <laughs> yeah. You've been brainwashed into thinking that moving these stones is possible, but you don't know what's possible. You have a warped perception of physics. <laughs> You've been brainwashed, and you have a warped perception of physics. <laughs> they just tell you that. <laughs> They're just like, you don't know what's possible. So, And so that's sort of, you know... But throughout... 
my documentary right here, this one, I am going to say that some of this is my own spiral conspiracy theories. Half of this is what I believe to be the truth with the geopolymer concrete and the solar energy and the travel in the world. All that, there's evidence for that being the truth. But then when I spiral on about the Hindu mythology, that's where it gets a little more controversial and a little bit more my opinion and a little bit more conspiracy-like. But it's still related to all these things. And what's weird about this whole video that I'm making right here now and this whole thing I'm doing, I started off just with this pyramid documentary that spoiled the stone mystery. And then I kind of was just like looking up some stuff to see if they were right. And then I was just doing some research and then just, you know, where the research led me was ridiculous. Like not only did I just get further and further convinced that this documentary is totally accurate and it spirals down this whole thing but it's weird because I think that I figured some stuff out that's even beyond you know and, and so that's where it's like oh Kyle you know what I mean so what it comes down to is is I think that I know it all I think that I figured it all out I'm gonna be the first person to say I figured it out I uh, I think I, I think I know I actually think I've made a bunch of connections and and, and yeah it's But yeah, so I think that I, I think that I figured it all out, and uh, I'm just gonna show you why I think that. I'm gonna show you why I no longer see magic in all these things. I no longer think that aliens built them. I no longer think that there's lost technology. I'm gonna show you everything that I've seen to give you my perspective on these things. And so that's why this thing is so long, is I tracked down everything, you know, everything that I could think of that I watched that I've ever seen on anything. I tracked down everything. And I put it in some sort of order. So something I sort of forgot to say. So I guess I haven't just laid out really what my theory is entirely. Because when I say that all these videos don't know what I'm talking about, what I mean by that is I'm using these videos to show my theory. These videos don't know about my theory. They're just helping me get a picture. Like this one documentary is about somebody traveled the world but they don't know it was the Egyptians. <laughs> and then this other documentary knows that the Egyptians might have traveled the world, but they don't know how they made the pyramids. And then this one documentary is like, oh, we know how the pyramids were made, but not any of these other things. And so I am grabbing all of these documentaries and all of these things, and I'm using all of these to point towards my conspiracy reality that I have in my mind. <laughs> and so what that theory is, People are always lo looking for a lost technology or a lost advanced civilization. But so, my theory is kind of going with yes but no. So, this whole theory is saying that the Egyptians are the ones that traveled the world. They made all these megaliths and they did it with harnessing the sun. And that's why all of these things and all these places worship the sun. And what it comes down to is I explain away all these impossible, miraculous things in a realistic way. I answer all these things without aliens and without advanced technology. And so that's what makes me think that this could be the truth because I explain away everything with just using not advanced anything. And so what the idea of this all sort of is is that in the past there was an advanced civilization, but they weren't like advanced to us. They were just advanced to the people back then. So my theory is that yes, Somebody had concrete and glass and knowledge about math. They had all that kind of stuff before we thought. Back 10,000, 12,000 years ago, there wasn't people with flying saucers and computers, but there were people with boats and cannons. And so we don't think about that. But so that's what this theory is pointing at, is that I think that there was a whole era, there was a whole 2,000, 3,000 years where the world was totally different than how it is now. Everybody was traveling around, everybody was doing, you know, but it was just different technology. It wasn't more advanced than us. Very interesting to think about. Okay, so we see all these things all across the world. And so we always think aliens or whatever because the same people built all these things. That's why we think aliens. People back in the day couldn't travel the world. So how did they do things all over the world? And then we think, oh, we don't know the human brain. Maybe these people did come to their own conclusions in different places. Maybe these people thought of something and they were like, oh, math. And then these people thought of something and they're like, oh, math and science. And maybe it was just a biology thing that we all kind of thought about and, and it popped up in different places. And, and so we don't know for sure. 
Right. So we don't know if, if, if one person influenced all these building things. But it's funny because you look at all of them and you kind of think, you know, the, the coincidences start, start becoming too many. <laughs> you start thinking that, okay, it has to be the same people. You start thinking that, okay, no, they're leaving a mark or they're doing something because it's not only the, the three, you know, the past, future, present doorways, but then it's the, the, the meter being everywhere, that, that form of measurement. <laughs> Okay, being consistent everywhere, and then it's like the the building techniques being consistent everywhere. Oh, the levitation or the or the or the big mystery is everywhere. Oh, and then the the geo, then the polygonal masonry. Oh, that's also the same sign that's in these places everywhere. Oh, and then they're always aligned to the constellation. Oh, well, that's also another signature that's in these things that are everywhere. <laughs> it's almost like whoever made all of these things put all of these things in there. Oh, this site. Oh, it's aligned to the stars. It's made out of this. It's magically done. It's back in the day. It's this, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's aligned, it's this, it has polygonal mystery, it has that. And so that's why we're starting to think, and, and everybody's slowly coming to the conclusion, oh, it has to be the same people. The same people had to have been all over the world. And so, okay, what's the, what's the theory now? The same people have been all over the world. And so, okay. <laughs> and so, if, if you don't believe in aliens or whatever. And, and it's funny, some people don't want to believe in aliens, but they just don't know how else to explain it. They see the evidence, and they and they don't know how else that would be possible other than aliens. And so, okay, it's possible if a civilization traveled the world twelve thousand years ago. You know, that's all that has to happen. <laughs> you know, they have to have technology enough to just be able to travel the world. So the sun. So the sun is a giant player in this game, and you know it's obvious that they worship the sun. But so I've been having this kind of argument with the world and the researchers. And anytime you ask them, oh, why do they worship the sun? Everybody's been saying, oh, the reason the Egyptians worship the sun is because oh, the sun. You know, without the sun, there'd be nothing. The world revolves around the sun. Everything revolves around the sun. When it rises in the morning, it lights up the darkness to where we can finally see. When it warms the planet to where we can be here. Without that, we would just be in space, floating in nothing, and we'd be too cold. And and you know, and we wouldn't live. And it controls all this stuff. It's just deeply connected to all these things. And it's like the reason for life. And so let's worship the sun. And, and for some reason, that doesn't sound right to me. Because did any of the ancient people know any of that at all? Like literally, though. Like, like literally, though. Because, you know what I mean? Be, okay, and okay, so think about this for a second. You know, in, in the previous version of this, I said, you know, if you're an ancient civilization living in the middle of the desert, you might think of the sun as the devil. You might not like it, you know. What if it burns you? What if you can't get away from it because there's not much shade and it burns you? And, and like, it's too hot. What if you don't like this? I mean, I don't know. You know, like I said, this debatable or whatever. It's just so funny because people are always like, oh, the sun. It's so obvious that the sun is, like, the reason for life and we should worship it. But to me, everything they describe for the sun of why it's great and it's such a life-bringing essence, why don't they worship water? Water literally does everything that you're, you were just talking about or whatever. Like, and, and there's so many other things you can worship. Like, and I, and I was getting into this little argument with ChatGPT. I was like, why did they worship the sun? And they gave me this long list of stuff. And I was like, oh, that sounds like the Nile. Why didn't they just worship the Nile? <laughs> She's like, oh, well, they did. And, but, you know, the, the flooding of the Nile was a big part of, of, you know, their stuff. And they contributed the sun to the flooding of the Nile. And, and that was an important step. So they worshiped it because that. And I was like, huh, but didn't they worship Sirius because they thought that that was related to the flooding of the Nile? That's star was literally the depiction of the flooding of the Nile. Like, it was the teller of that, and Sirius, like, literally flooded the Nile. So, so didn't they worship that because of that? And they're like, oh, yeah, well, you know, you're actually right about that. It's funny that you know that. So, but, uh, <laughs> but, okay, yeah, what I'm pretty much trying to say about the sun is just, like, okay, so I know that the sun is, like, you know, I just wonder why they're so obsessed with it, I guess. Because, yeah, you're like, okay, so the sun's cool, this or that, but then again, you know, it's not unique. You know, maybe it's cool because it does all these things, but it's not really unique or special in any real way. So why do you have such an obsession? When I'm doing my research trying to find out why they like the sun so much, they're like, oh, well, the sun, like, it helps plants grow and it helps all this stuff. Yeah, I was like, how did they know that the sun helped the plants grow? They didn't know about photosynthesis. And they're like, oh, yeah, what? but they would have noticed that the plants grew better in the sun than when in the shade. And I was like, but then again, also, they would have noticed that plants grew better where there was water or they got water constant. So why didn't, that's why when I say the sun isn't special, it's like, I get that the sun's special, but it's just funny because you got to think about it. You're like, oh, well, you can always explain away something else for when they say, oh, but the sun does this. You can say, oh, well, but this also. Like fire is a good one. It's like, oh, heat and light. 
the sun's awesome because it's heat and light and it's all these things. And it's like, okay, but fire is literally almost a replica of that, but a handheld sort of manipulatable version. Like, if they understood fire and, like, and, like, how to make it, they could pretty much have a portable sun that way. Like, why didn't they worship fire? Or it's like, oh, but the sun is the reason for life. It's like, but, but water is kind of the reason for life, though, you know? And I'm pretty sure that they knew the importance of water when it came to the crops and, like, life. And it's just like, I don't know. You can explain away everything that they say is so good about the sun. You can say, oh, but what about this? Oh, well, what about this? And it's like, I get it that whatever but at the same time every time i see an ink that has like a beetle in it that's wrapped in a snake that has like an eye in it and then i'm like okay that's a symbol of a sun wrapped in a sun uh and the whole thing's in the shape of a sun like it's pretty much what all that symbolism means is it's just like it's like okay so why do they have sun symbols overlapped on things all the time or why does every building like the doorway shaped like a sun it's studded in suns the top of the ceiling it looks like a sun and it's just like so so we get that the sun is is cool and sure maybe they had their reasons for liking it or whatever but why is it everywhere on everything and you're drilling it into everybody's mind and you're obsessed with it like that's the that's the word to use why were they obsessed with it and so that's kind of where you got to wonder and you realize about the solar energy part and you're like oh okay if they realize solar energy and then they start doing simple experiments with that and realize that it changes everything. But it's funny because these flowers, these Sumerian flowers, I was wondering, I was like, why do they have sunflowers or like daisies or whatever on like their watches and, and their, their necklaces? They like stud their clothes with these sunflowers like it's above their doorways. These sunflowers are on everything. And I was doing research. I was like, are sunflowers or daisies or whatever those are even native to that area? Because I kind of think that those are suns. And it's funny because they're not suns. They are flowers. But you want to know what the flowers are meant to represent? The sun. Sunflowers represented the sun. But daisies also represent the sun because they looked like it. And so it's funny because, sure, it is a daisy or whatever. But daisies represented the sun. So when I asked ChatGPT, I was like, so could it pretty much just be seen as a sun symbol? Like if it's a flower and the flower represents it, and because it looks like it, then then could it just be said that those are just suns? And it's like, yeah, I guess. I mean, yeah, you could think of it that way because, yeah, I mean, pretty much, they, yeah, they could even just be suns because that would make sense. And then I'm just like... So it's like, okay, so I made a list, actually. If you're looking at a hieroglyphic, what is something that could represent the sun? There's suns, there's anks, crosses, flowers, eyes, beetles, snakes, dragons, serpents, stars, even just circles, half circles. There's like seven people that if you see them, they mean the sun. And then wings. I'm sure I'm missing at least one or two. But And it's funny because then you see statues that have all these things on it. And you're like, what, is that necessary? We see suns everywhere and all their stuff. And we're always just like, oh, that's just there because, you know, the sun, it's an obvious thing. It's like one of the first things humans should notice. It lights up the darkness. Good versus evil. Humans aren't nocturnal, so it's like we can only really be alive when it's here. Nowadays, when we think about why we like the sun, we think about, oh, Goldilocks zones, right? Life on Earth, or life at all, is only able to exist because of the sun. Because... Because of our planet and what's on it and the distance to our sun and the existence of it, we're able to be at a correct temperature for life. And so we always think, oh, the sun is the reason that we exist, literally almost because of that. But I don't think that the ancient people knew about that. Oh, yeah, I forgot one that's not on this list. <clears throat> the flower of life. Think about that, a big yellow lotus flower. Oh, it could be said that the sun sort of resembles a big yellow lotus flower and that that would be a flower of life because weren't we just talking about flowers being, you know what, I'll shut up. You know, you get it though. So, <laughs> and it's funny because, so you know why I think they really worship the sun? Because they had solar power. Because solar energy ruled the ancient world. Period. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's actually so obvious and it's so ridiculous because... I was doing research and I was like, hey, ChatGPT, I'm trying to make a list of all the similarities that these megaliths had. You know, I was like, you know, a lot of them share polygonal masonry. A lot of them have these stone clamps. They're all like magically done. They're all in the same time period. And I was making a list of all the similarities, right? 
I was like, oh, a lot of them are in really weird places. Like, it's hard, they're hard to get to. So it's questionable how they got this big of a thing either up there or down this thing. So it's always a mystery in that way. And I'm like, oh, and a lot of them are aligned to constellations or aligned to the stars. And so I made this big list of, of similarities. And I asked this chatbot AI thing. And I was like, hey, is there anything on this list that I'm forgetting? Is there any similarities between all of these things that I missed? You know, because I haven't been to them. I like to think I don't know it all. So I was like, is there anything on this list that I missed or that I don't know about? Like, is there any similarities between all these things that aren't on here? And you know what it said? <laughs> this is unbelievable. Because <laughs> they said they all are l rumored and there's myths that they've all been built by a sun cult. They said, because not only are all of these aligned to the stars, but a lot of them, if not all of them, are also aligned to the sun on either the winter or the summer solstice. And on top of that, all of them have a carving, a depiction, a rumor, a symbol, like a something in the form of a sun. All of them. All of them. All, you know, even Stonehenge. I saw a stupid little weird carving of a sun in the corner of one of these blocks that I never knew about. There's... <laughs> And I was like, what do you mean a sun cult? And then, after that, I realized that every single hieroglyphic you'll ever see has a sun on it. And not only, you know, the, the thing around their head that looks like a cobra, whatever, you know, the, the, like the Sphinx has this hood that looks like a cobra thing. You know, even that could be, you know, somebody standing and the sun coming and shining around their head as a halo. Yeah, you know, and that's a little far out. That's a little whatever, but that is a that is a thing that the gods at the top of pyramids, you know, when the solstice is aligned, they'd have the sun rise over them, and it would like create a halo and a head thing, and it's like they would think that they're godly because they could align themselves with this thing, and they they could predict when the sun would rise, and they would stand there, and and the people didn't know these things. They just looked like gods to them, and then, but so, but so that's not even relevant. But but so, but so what I'm trying to say is that okay, so so even snakes, snakes. Or representations of the sun. In ancient Egypt, snakes were often associated with the sun. The snake was seen as a powerful creature that could shed its skin and be reborn, just as the sun appeared to die each night and be reborn each morning. The god Ra was the Egyptian god of the sun and was closely associated with snakes. One of Ra's forms was that of a giant serpent called the Uraeus, which was often shown on the pharaoh's headdress. The snake is often seen as a symbol of transformation, rebirth, and healing. In many cultures, including ancient Egypt, the snake is also associated with wisdom and knowledge, as well as with hidden or secret knowledge. Okay, so I know that the Uraeus is obviously like a snake head. I know that that's what that is, and I know that yes, that is like a head dress. I know that that is like a hat thing. But what I'm saying is that I think that hat thing is based off of that imagery of the sun stuff. And like I said, I know it's a cobra head, but you know, maybe that's partially why they thought that cobras were sacred or whatever, because you know they had that imagery of the behind their head thing like naturally there is what amongst other reasons but yeah so i know that the sphinx is a person wearing one of those things but i'm saying that that hat is worn by those people to symbolize that imagery it's like they're walking around with the sun behind their head like that's what that hat is supposed to symbolize or show or whatever and like i said i know that it's a snake head but it's like both you know and and snakes were representing the sun and they were synonymous with the sun and like snakes are always connected to light and the sun so you know there's something there you know what i mean so i know that the sphinx isn't like literally the sun coming behind his head but that hat is that imagery so in a way it sort of is but I know that it's not, but you know what I mean. It goes back to, it's interesting because when I say that, oh, the Egyptians were the ones that traveled the world, they were the aliens that taught these people things. And then it's funny because you think about all the serpent beings or all the legends of snake people. You know, like the Nagas? You hear about the Nagas nowadays all the time, and there's like other places like, oh, they're snake people. Like, oh, the Mayans. Their god was a feathered serpent, a dragon lady. And, and it's so funny because, you know, one of the main Egyptian gods, one of, the, one of the people that actually was a real person, not just a god, but somebody that actually existed, Wajet, I think is how you say their name, was literally like a feathered serpent, was a female snake god goddess the uraeus headdress thing is like based off of her she like wore a snake mask but other than that you know how the uraeus kind of looks like a cobra head okay people that looked like snakes oh the nagas like they were these snake people oh they weren't snake people because remember they had regular legs and arms and everything they just had snake heads oh kind of like how this chick had a snake mask and they always have have masks and kind of like how the uraeus thing like literally gives them a cobra head 
Like, isn't that interesting that the Urias headdress literally makes them have a cobra head, in a way? And so, oh, they weren't snake people, they just had snake heads. Except for that's not possible, probably, so they're probably talking about that. So, you know what I mean. Isn't that kind of weird? But yeah, we'll actually come back to that later. The ankh, the cross of the circle, is a, the symbol of life. I think it might be a symbol of a magnifying glass, or, you know, but it's also related to the sun. You know, and so and so there's like seven sun gods. There's like 17 different symbols that mean sun. Like every other symbol just means sun in some way. And like they and like every hieroglyphic has a sun. Their doorways are shaped like the sun. Their you know every single thing that they make is like aligned to the sun. And and so and then all across the world, you find like all these temples. Like oh, in Mexico, this is the the, the land of the sun. Oh, because they also just just love the warmth. Yeah, no, all of these places. Yeah, yeah, over in on this island that's in the middle of the ocean. Oh yeah, they made a sun observatory that that clocks the stars and 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 oh yeah, they're just another separate people that knew how to do that stuff that long ago on that island for no reason, just randomly, and they just also worship the sun for no reason, you know. <laughs> but no, it's just like, and, but so every hieroglyphic ever has like seventy suns on it. And I don't think it's because, oh, oh, whatever your dumb excuse even was. Like, no, it's because once I start telling you the capabilities of their solar power, it's ridiculous. Because, yeah, they could have had electricity just based off of, you know, this old Greek steam furnace, you know, that's been pretty much proven that they stole the concept from Egypt. Greek and Romans stole everything from Egypt. They even actually literally stole Egypt. And so it's funny because, you know, when people are like, oh, the history of this, and, or, oh, did this really come from this? Because, oh, I thought that was the Greeks. And it's like, okay, so. Egypt has been stolen and taken over literally 13 times. 12 or 13 times. The Romans stole and took everything from them, pretty much. Uh, and so, and that's just... That's not even me talking crap. That's literally just the way it is. And it's kind of ridiculous because this steam engine, if you have a big enough thing of water and you have this thing and you have the sun pointing on it, you literally have a perpetual motion machine as long as the sun's out. Oh, you have electricity and power as long as the sun's out. Oh, wouldn't that be a reason that you would want to keep track of that? Oh, if you only have electricity when the sun's out, wouldn't you want to know exactly when that's going to go away each day? Oh, so all of a sudden there's a reason for your meticulous really anal down to every decimal point you know tracking of the sun oh you have these monoliths that, that help you easily keep track of the sun not only that every freemason symbol that you'll ever see has a sun on it and it all starts falling apart you know what i mean and then it's like what is this it's like okay so yeah polygonal masonry oh maybe this was something people figured out independently on every continent they just came up with this very specific unique intricate technique on their own independently everywhere and then you see this and then you think of the sun cult and then everybody's like oh they're putting flowers in the polygonal masonry you're like okay so you know it's up for debate that you know these things were made by a sun cult and you know these magical rocks were melted with the sun and you know and they were made with the sun and the sun made these things possible and and there's a big sun cult floating around and they put sun symbols and flowers on everything and there's always flowers and circles and and all these sun symbols on everything but no yeah that is that polygonal mystery thing is a flower and it has nothing to do with suns at all uh and it's a flower and even and even though flowers do have to do with suns that one doesn't and and, and that's not even a sun. That just kind of looks like that sort of a little bit, kind of. And the other shapes that they make with polygonal masonry that are blatantly things aren't things either. So it's like, you know what? But it's just like... <laughs> but I've seen polygonal masonry, and then I saw this picture, and I was like... I'm like, what? And it's funny because everything is a sun. Pentagrams, I'm pretty sure, are just suns. Oh, no, those are stars. And even a star symbol, I'm pretty sure, is the sun. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Aren't stars suns? Oh my god, what? So yeah, I think pentagrams, the Jewish star, all like even these flowers. These flower oh nope, that's not a it just looks like a flower. That's actually supposed to be a sun. <laughs> They're everywhere. And I don't think that it's because of this magical knowledge that they didn't know about. Oh, but the earth revolves around the sun. <laughs> Did they know that? Oh, the reason that life exists is because of the sun. Oh, did they know that? Or did, or could they melt things with it and they used it for everything and it became the most useful thing in their life? 
and they could travel the world and they could make all these things and and it transformed everything for them and and it literally made them an advanced society when they realized solar power they became an advanced society that could conquer the world maybe that's why they worshipped it not because it was warm <laughs> you know what i mean so it's like it's ridiculous because yeah over there it's not warm it's too hot so think about that for a second you know what i mean it's <laughs> It gets me riled up because it's like it's so clearly just blatantly obvious and right there and people are just like oh But legends or myths or my own denial and I'm like Sounds like a you thing, you know, <laughs> and I guess while we're on the topic of Freemasons or whatever If anybody's interested about that part of it like Kyle did you just say that? So okay, so something that I saw to Amon Ra for his greatness Amon Ra that's the Sun God. Yes, the most important God of all of Egypt for the simple reason that without the sun, there would be nothing. That's I right, mean, and they understood that energy. Sure. Yeah, even this guy on this show, I'm pretty sure he's a Freemason or whatever, I don't know. People say that in the YouTube comments, uh, and it kind of seems like he does know what's happening and it's just kind of playing dumb or, i don't know but it's funny because i listen to people's words and and stuff when they talk and, and it's funny because i thought this interaction between them was pretty funny and it happened so fast and i don't know if it's anything that anybody else caught on to for the simple reason that without the sun there would be nothing that's I mean, right and they understood that energy sure and so i heard that and immediately just rolled my eyes. Oh, the reason that life exists is because of the sun. Oh, did they know that? And that's why I thought it was funny that she responded with, and they understood that energy. And But it's funny because, and then he responds with, sure. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I thought that was funny. A 3,500 year old obelisk being restored in Central Park has set me on a journey to find out if the Freemasons a secret order that was largely responsible for establishing America could have existed during the time of the pharaohs in ancient Egypt. Link right to Masonic symbols. Wait a minute, you're saying these are tangible artifacts that connect directly to Freemasonry? Yes. Now, a lot of people believe that modern Freemasonry started in 1717, but is there a connection going back to ancient Egypt? In the Taurian era, the stellar theme predominates but enigmatically, salient elements are revived and disclosed by hermetics of Egypt's last renaissance, the Greco-Roman period. The hermetics were Egyptians. It's with the, where the Freemasons came from and the alchemists. And the hermetics comes from Hermes Trismegistus, Hermes Thrice Great, who was supposedly the wisest man or avatar or god from the Egyptian period. New York is one of America's oldest cities, but there's something inside Central Park that's much, much older than the United States. I was surprised to learn that there's an ancient Egyptian obelisk here, and more surprised to hear that artifacts tied to Freemasonry were found under it at its original location in Egypt. That doesn't make any sense, since modern Freemasonry didn't get started until 3,000 years after this obelisk was finished, that is, unless there was a form of Freemasonry that existed much earlier. This could mean that the men who built the pyramids were intimately tied to the men who built this country. History says the Knights Templar were hunted to extinction in 1307. Mikey Kay and Garth Baldwin are pressure testing a different theory, that the Templars survived and eventually transformed into secret societies that still exist today. The Order of the Knights Templar, called the Guardians of the Temple, was actually an order of concrete temple builders. They gave themselves over to the church after being massacred in 1312. Requests to make churches, theaters, cultural centers, buildings public and private continue to grow. Many concrete construction companies were born all over Europe. They were called the Freemason in England and in France the Font Maçon the Compagnon de Devoir, and others the Maître Comencini. Over the centuries, they came together to form a single international body, the Freemasons. They enacted a sacred rule. The plans, the information, the archives of each building will be kept secret, hidden from the general public. They invented the legend of carving stone for the average person, common mortals. 
extracting the minerals to make concrete became easier, the composition of the mixtures improved, and the limestone extraction process, grinding, lime manufacturing, was gradually industrialized. Another way to distinguish a cut stone from a cast stone is the imprint of tissue. Some masons used linen fabrics so that the concrete could be easily detached from the formwork mold. These imprints are found in all buildings. These marks are visible on the first row, that is to say, the first stones laid at the start of the construction. Sometimes they mixed shells in the concrete, like the ancient Egyptians. When we visit these monuments, we are both amazed but also doubtful, with a feeling that something is wrong. In fact, the builders did not suffer as much by cutting stones as you might imagine. They were not the faithful of the church that built them, but rather specialized and organized teams, masters of architecture and concrete. The Vatican placed orders to make basilicas and cathedrals. The church propagated the legend of the carved stone made from the suffering and sweat of the faithful. Thousands of faithful Catholics carried by their immense faith who cut stones for the glory of the Holy Church. But it goes surprisingly deep. Very interesting how it relates to Hindu mythology. And like, just, it gives me chills right now just talking about it. <laughs> but maybe it's because the window's open, I don't know. But it's crazy. There's so many things. But okay, so one of the main arguments against this whole theory, I don't think holds too much weight. Because this theory is saying that the Egyptians are the, you know, they were the first ones to travel the world and they went all over the planet and they spread their knowledge or and or they just posted up in places and, and built things and and they left their mark all over with all these things like probably on purpose but there's so many things that that look like their signatures or their things that couldn't have been learned independently that had to have been taught and so and so but the main argument against that is people say oh but the egyptians didn't travel the world or nobody traveled the world that long ago or nobody was able to or whatever and so what I think about when I think about that is, uh, we don't know anything about our past, okay? And the evidence is actually starting su to suggest that theory that nobody traveled the world isn't true. So when you say, hey, like when you do your research and you say, hey, did the Egyptians travel the world? They say, no, they did a fair amount of traveling. They did have boats uh, and they were around for over 3,000 years, but it's not known how far they went and they probably didn't travel the world or go that far. They definitely didn't go to every continent or whatever. And then you're just like, why? Like if they had boats and if they were around for so long and you know, wh uh, why didn't they travel the world? You know, cause yeah, we live in year 2023. You know, they made it to 3000 years. They were around for 3000 years. And if they didn't have computers, they didn't have smartphones to be distracted by. <laughs> they didn't have electricity. You know, if they didn't have all these things and they were around for 3000 years, you really don't think that they at least traveled the world and then so when you ask the scientific community why don't you think that they traveled the world if they were around for so long and if they had boats and if they were known to have traveled and traded and done all these things why don't we think that they traveled the whole world or or explored everywhere and they just say oh well we don't know either way there's just no evidence that they did so show us evidence that they did because there's no evidence that they did and so we just go off of evidence but all of these stone structures could be the evidence and so i guess that's what i'm trying to show you in this whole thing but yeah another thing they also say and they wouldn't have been able to that's another argument that you hear sometimes why don't we think that they traveled the world or explored everywhere they wouldn't have been able to and it's like okay what makes you think that because then you start doing your research and you're like okay what's needed to travel the oceans like could you just get in a canoe and cross the ocean like if you had enough like i'm trying not to say balls <laughs> if you had enough just like oomph like could you just get the canoe and and if you had the dedication and, and you didn't give a shit and like you just had like a blanket or, or whatever you, you needed like could you just cross the ocean maybe or is that impossible and you know what i found out you could totally do that <laughs> i mean it's pretty much almost impossible but it's not it's not impossible. You could totally cross the ocean in a bullshit little raft that you made. It's possible, <laughs> you know, because it's been done before, even in modern day. And so that's interesting to think. So, okay, 
crackhead motherfuckers across like with canoes and shit. And I don't even know if that's really true, but 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 back in like old times, it's been known that people did cross in sketchy ways. And then you look at the <laughs> Egyptians' boats, and you're like, oh, they had like legit boats, like they were legit architects, like they were legit like scientists. They like legitimately knew about mathematics. They knew about science. They knew about chemistry. They knew about the stars. It's like, what do you need to travel the oceans? Oh, you would have to have some knowledge of how to accord the earth to the stars. <laughs> it's like, okay, check. <laughs> they like pretty much invented that. Uh, so next, <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's what it was. They're like, they would have needed a sextant and, and that didn't exist till years and years later. I'm like, well, I don't even know what a sextant is, but uh, did they have anything like a sextant? And they're like, well, yeah, they had the blah, 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 which was literally a sextant. They just didn't call it that. And I'm like, so you would need a sextant to cross the ocean, but they didn't have one, so they couldn't have done it. Oh, but they did have one. They just didn't call it that. And there's, <laughs> and there's eye rolling moments like that everywhere because <laughs> it's so dumb. And then you're like, okay, so they would have had some sort of knowledge of, about the earth being round possibly or, or whatever. I mean, that's not even really, I mean, but, but it's like, okay, yeah, they, there's, I have two different examples of how or, or why they could have known that. And it's, and it's interesting, maybe even three actually. But so I'm pretty sure they did know that the earth was round and they, they traveled doing the thing and, and that was kind of their mark kind of of like, you know, this thing about the obelisk with Carl Sagan. Here's a map of ancient Egypt. I've inserted two sticks or obelisks, one up here in Alexandria and one down here in Syene. Now, if at a certain moment, each stick casts no shadow, no shadow at all, that's perfectly easy to understand, provided the Earth is flat. If the shadow at Syene is at a certain length and the shadow at Alexandria is the same length, that also makes sense on a flat Earth. But how could it be, Eratosthenes asked, that at the same instant, there was no shadow at Syene and a very substantial shadow at Alexandria? The only answer was that the surface of the Earth is curved. It's funny because I've seen people in the comments, this is how you can tell that I've actually, like, you know, obelisks, you know, debatably were made for these kind of experiments and for these purposes of tracking the sun and the shadows and doing experiments. And they were put in strategic places. Oh, so it's interesting and weird. But then somebody in the comments is like, oh, but if they didn't have cell phones or, or walkie talkies, how could they have ever been at this obelisk at this time and this obelisk at this time and communicated for the shadows to be different? They wouldn't have been able to do that. And I'm just like, okay, think about this though. There's a person at each obelisk all day long, and they're recording the shadows throughout the day. And at the end of the day, or the next day, they meet up and they compare the shadows. I know that might have blown your head off. I know that might have blown your mind to the point where, you know, it, but so that is, you know, and you know, I, when I saw that comment, I didn't even say that. There's a part of me that wanted to be like, but I was just like, you know what? I'll just let that person believe whatever they want. But, but yeah, so, there's that. That's one way. But maybe I'm too clever. Maybe I'm the only person that ever would have thought about that. The ancient Egyptians probably never would have thought about that. Only me. I can think about that situation for two seconds, and I'm a genius. So I just came up with that uh, solution instantly. And I'm the only person that could ever do that. They could never come up with that solution uh, through thousands and thousands of years. But I could do it instantly. But so it's ridiculous. But yeah, it's just stupid. People are just like, the Egyptians couldn't travel the world. They, I mean, they could have. They did technically have, like, the balls, the enthusiasm, the knowledge, the technology. <laughs> they did have all the things, but... And they did leave evidence, and, and they did talk about it. They did carve it on their walls. They did tell stories about it, but those are just myths. They were traveling the stars, not the oceans. Those stories are talking about traveling the stars, not the oceans. Yeah, listen to that sentence. Roughly one and a half miles southeast of this ancient city lies the Temple of Hathor. Among the vast hieroglyphs that cover the columns of the temple are numerous depictions of pharaohs standing on mysterious ships and purportedly traveling through the stars. Yeah, yeah, Kyle, you're wrong. Because those stories are talking about traveling the stars and they're myths. They're not traveling the oceans and it's not a real story. That's what you guys are telling me, so, you know, sorry, or whatever. The chords represent his connection between heaven and earth. As the divine cord holder, it was said he traversed the skies and measured the bounds of the earth. In Greek mythology, Utu Shamash was known as the sun god Apollo. In Egypt, he was known as the god Hippocrates. Shamash was often depicted with wings. But, I don't know. 
there's pictures of it, you know, not pictures, but yeah, their hieroglyphics are pretty much pictures. They're carving it in stone. They're telling us that for some reason. But yeah, so I definitely think that they traveled the world, I guess is the, the you know, coming back to the whole thing, you know. What I'm trying to come back to is I think that they, they definitely traveled the world. And I think that all this stuff is indirect evidence of that. So bear with it. <laughs> what I'm about to show you will likely blow your mind because by the end of this video, you will have seen overwhelming evidence that a mysteriously long-lost ancient human civilization once spanned virtually our entire planet. And the implications of that are incredible because it means that what we were taught in school and is still being taught is really off. I'm about to show you more than 250 photos and comparisons of ancient sites from around the world. What are the odds of Egypt, Cambodia, China, Mexico, Indonesia, Iran, and the list goes on and on, all building pyramids with having zero contact with each other? Showed the similarities, not just between pyramids, but between construction methods all over the world. In Japan, I had no idea that they had made the sarcophagus covers in Japan mm -hmm. that were exactly the same shape right. as the one, and odd oddly shaped exactly the same as the ones they made in egypt and in a place there is supposed to be zero connection between ancient japan and ancient egypt that's not supposed to exist uncannily similar impossible almost impossible that two people would come up with the same design like this lighter it is an unusually shaped lighter the way the top pops the, right. if someone just coincidentally came up with this on the other side of the planet be like how the f it's so oddly shaped, right. like the buttons in the same place, the lids in the same place. There's no way. Right. That's what it yeah. looks like to me. The thing I found about the Egyptians in Ohio was actually from a paper that was written. It's a, it's postulating it. I guess they took a lot of the evidence that had they had been finding and saying this shows that there might have actually been Egyptians there. Oh, that's from 1937. That's when the guy was, I think, born. This is 40 years ago. Oh so wow. That amulet was brass apparently, and it was found mm -hmm. near Cincinnati. The Lost City of the Grand Canyon Over a century ago, an incredible archaeological discovery was made in the Grand Canyon. What did archaeologists find? Did an ancient civilization have an outpost there? Was there a repository in the caves below the Grand Canyon? These are the legendary claims that may just have an element of truth. It all started in 1909 when purported Smithsonian Institution explorer G. E. Kincaid discovered strange caverns during an expedition directed by Smithsonian anthropologist S.A. Jordan. The entrance to the cavern was nearly inaccessible, but Kincaid was able to get in to make an incredible discovery. In a cross chamber near the entrance was the statue of a Buddha. Upon entering the cave, the story tells of elaborate paths, mammoth-sized rooms, an underground citadel, enough space to accommodate 50,000 people, idols, tablets, copper instruments, the remains of prehistoric animals, and, most shockingly, Egyptian mummies? Kincaid also found what he believed to be hieroglyphic writing like that found in the peninsula of the Yucatan, Mexico. This was a significant discovery, no doubt about it. Still, the Smithsonian Institute will report it has no records on the subject. So what happened? How did we get from a remarkable discovery to zero evidence? With no admittance of anything, some have said that the entire discovery has since become the center of a major cover-up, apparently to maintain the old status quo, which is that the ancient Egyptians never ventured outside the tranquil waters of the River Nile. One book, Ancient Secret of the Flower of Life, claims that two backpackers on their way found a pyramid made from the native rock. They claim to have seen several cave entrances. If the discovery was real, why is it so difficult to find the site? Grand Canyon National Park encompasses more than 1.2 million acres. If visitors go too far in the vast labyrinth of corridors, caves, and holes, they're lost forever. Interestingly, the area around 94 Mile Creek and Trinity Creek has sites with names such as Tower of Set, Tower of Ra, Horus Temple, Osiris Temple, etc. In the Haunted Canyon area are such names as Chiop's Pyramid, the Buddha Cloister, Buddha Temple, Manu Temple, and Shiva Temple. Huh. 
All right, guys, we just got to the back of the trail here and uh, we made it here to the sage wall and I'm staring at this thing. And uh, my initial impression is, I mean, come on, that's not nature. Since I got out here, I I'm still just so blown away at this. Look, bro, can y'all see this? There is clear as day another wall just as defined as the main sage wall right here all of the old megalithic precision work that you see in other places in the world so here's one of the doors here and again they're using this shape this kind of rectangular but with a bit of a flare at the bottom we've seen this in so many places all over the world how are they all coming to the same design like i, I it just seems crazy the pyramids of Peru are the oldest known archaeological sites in the Americas. These two sites are located in the same region and date back to around 3500 BC. They're known as Corral and Sechen Bajo. These were possibly the first constructions in the Americas and yet some of the most impressive. They're left in extreme ruin but they were once massive pyramids, possibly similar to what we see in other parts of the Americas like in Teotihuacan or Cahokia Mound site. But where did these people come from? And where did they learn this technology? We're told they were primitive hunter-gatherers one day and building these huge pyramids and city centers the next. This is a time period in culture we know very little about. Different types of civilization can coexist on the same planet shouldn't be surprising to us because we do it. And that's what I'm suggesting was the case back then. But a civilization very different from our own. They certainly had enough technology to explore the Earth, enough technology to map the Earth, highly advanced astronomical knowledge that should not have been possessed by hunter-gatherer civilizations. A knowledge of obscure astronomical phenomena such as the precession of the equinoxes, such as the liquidity of the ecliptic, could only have been accumulated through thousands of years of careful observation. But yeah, like I said, some people don't want to believe in aliens or whatever. They just are forced to because they look at this and they have no other way to explain it. But I, with this, am explaining it in a way that makes sense. It not only makes sense, it makes like a lot of sense. This is one of the mysteries of Gobekli Tepe. That uh, the archaeology does show this quite clearly. That when the work began on Gobekli Tepe 11,600 years ago, the entire population there were hunter-gatherers. They were not agriculturalists, generating those supposed surpluses that would allow experts in architecture to emerge. They were hunter-gatherers. And how in God's name do a group of hunter-gatherers wake up one morning and create something like this? And then the mystery deepens, because at the same time, that they're building the megalithic site, they're also suddenly doing agriculture. And I say, I actually don't think that this was something that was just dreamed up overnight by a group of hunter-gatherers. I think I'm looking at a transfer of technology. I think people came to that site who already knew how to do this stuff. And maybe they used that site to mobilize the local population, to push them into a new direction. And that was truly the beginnings of civilization as we know it. This all existed thousands of years before the academics said that civilizations did. And the academics will say, oh, well, the hunter-gatherers made it. How did they have the time? If you are a hunter-gatherer, all of your time has to go on catching your dinner and making your family. This temple was made by organized people, but incredibly skilled people that would have to spend time away from hunter-gathering and spend a lifetime learning constellations and learning about ley lines and learning how to carve a correct cheetah. The whole thing just screams that we've got something wrong in the timeline. I feel like we're missing something and we're not, we're not keeping our minds open. There are big questions in the world that need to be answered. And so what happened was that the Egyptians, they got technologically advanced because of their mathematical system that they discovered or invented. Again, we've seen this in so many places all over the world. How are they all coming to the same design? It just seems crazy. Here is how the Egyptians reasoned. Pi is divided by the first 10 whole numbers. They use the whole number 7. Pi divided by 7 equals 44.8 to make these niches. This is the basis of the niche. On this basis, they establish the golden rectangle. The base is divided by 7. They subtracted this result from the measurement of the top of the niche. 
Here is the shape of the niche, which is created, all in centimeters. Frankly, given the geometry applied, do you still think that these builders are the Incas? So this is why it all starts to unravel, and this is where it all starts to make sense. Because that's the very first question, and the very first seed of everything, is if people were hunter-gatherers, how did they ever find the free time to learn anything? <laughs> you know, and so that's where it all comes back to Egypt, and the holiacal rising of Sirius, and the floods of the Nile, and it all starts to come together. Because, okay, they were hunter-gatherers, that were successful, that were able to, you know, have farms and have some sort of system, right? But then they had floods of the Nile. And then so they start realizing, you know, with the stars that they could actually predict when that would happen because of the year and the seasons and watching the stars. And so they started to keep track of those things because of that. Oh, this flood comes in every year and ruins our shit. And they start to catch on to that. That, okay, every now and again, this flood comes in and ruins all our shit. But then it goes away. And then they find out how to keep track of that. Okay, And that's the beginning of mathematics. That's the beginning of, of watching the stars. That's the beginning of everything. Because they start paying attention to that. They start paying attention to what numbers are. Oh, the fingers. And, and, you know, they have their little plots of land that always get ruined. So they start measuring them out. And they start making actual parameters of, okay, this is where my land is. So when things get flooded and ruined, and then when the water goes away, we're going to know where my land is because of this marker that we're going to make. Okay? But then, so they start measuring things. And it, and it all gets so deep so quick. But so, when the Nile flooded, they had months of vacation. You know, all of their fields were, were flooded. They couldn't work. They couldn't do anything. They had to go to dry land. They had to take their stock of everything that they could gather and they had to just go survive for two months until the water went away and then they'd come back and, and they'd rebuild and start their stuff again and so you know word on the street is that during those two months of, of vacation or, or downtime they would just think and study and try things and learn things and experiment with their new findings about math and the stars and, and they would watch the stars and they would they, they would start counting things they start keeping track of things they start measuring things they start doing things and oh my god as soon as the Nile returned to its bed, a big problem had arisen. Field limits had disappeared. It was then necessary to retrace the limits of the fields of each peasant, and they had to be traced correctly. Therefore, the Egyptians began to draw straight lines, rectangles, squares, diagonals, circles, and triangles with strings and sticks. It was the beginning of geometry. Everything was noted on papyrus. They understood a fundamental function of nature. Everything is divided or assembled in small equal units. This observation will serve them throughout their discoveries. Centuries later, these discoveries were taken out of secret coffers and renamed. The royal finger was called the centimeter, the royal hand the decimeter, and the royal leg the meter. The Egyptians also discovered the golden ratio. They reasoned thus, since the gods use these sacred figures everywhere in nature, in order to remain connected to nature ourselves, we must integrate them into our buildings to do as the gods do. Simple reasoning, but genius. Sacred principles. The Egyptians will integrate the universal constants everywhere. Pi, the golden ratio, the royal cubit, the whole panoply of sacred geometry with the meter. The Egyptians knew the Fibonacci sequence in the golden number thousands of years before him and called it the addition sequence. The temple of Khafre, the temple of Edfu, Akhenaten's palaces are built with the golden rectangle. They took a disc with the diameter of a royal leg and wrapped a string around it. They unrolled the string and measured it. The parameter of the disc was three royal legs and 14 royal fingers or 314 royal fingers. A disc with a diameter of 10 unrolled corresponded to 31 units and 4 subunits. A disc with a diameter of 1 corresponded to 3 units and to 14 subunits. One number stood out each time. 314, 31.4, 3.14. They thought this number was important. This figure is pi, 3.14. Egyptians knew pi with precision, long before Archimedes. From this experience, they also deduced the decimal system. They cut the disc into six, 
measured it on the royal leg, the meter. They got the number 52 centimeters and 36 subunits, millimeters. They wrote it down and thought this was important. During their observations, they noted that the volume of a sphere represents 52.36% the volume of a cube. Whenever the volume of the cube and the sphere increases proportionally, this number does not vary. In so doing, they discovered one of the most important universal constants, kept secret, the number 52.36. Twice, in volumes and forms, this number is everywhere. They conclude that this number is sacred. The Egyptians discovered the number 52.36, which is a universal constant like pi and phi. The number 52.36 is an important universal constant, more than pi and the golden ratio, since it connects 2D space with that of 3D. Now, how does one incorporate this sacred number? They put a stick on the royal leg, the meter, which is divided into 100 units. They cut the stick so that it made 52 royal fingers and 36 subunits. The royal cubit was born. The royal cubit equals 52.36 drops of water, or 52.36 centimeters. From then on, all of Egypt would have as a standard a universal constant, the royal cubit. The Egyptian royal cubit as presented in museums, 28 fingers or 7 palms, is incomprehensible. It is disguised so that the people do not understand the origin of this cubit. It doesn't matter who disguised the cubit, but when you put it on a meter, it displays 52 centimeters, 30 millimeters, and 6 tenths of a millimeter. It becomes a universal constant. It takes on all its meaning. They invented another measure, half the meter minus 5 millimeters, called the Babylonian royal cubit. They used these two standards, and the meter was deliberately hidden. It is for this reason that we find the meter everywhere in the Great Pyramid, since the royal cubit is graduated on the meter. Any other unit, the yard, the inch, the mile, the nautical mile, the pica, the foot, are all arbitrary or graduated on the meter. There is nothing universal or unchanging in nature that measures one inch, one yard, or a mile. And then all of a sudden, they realize how to make concrete and glass, and they start making all these crazy things. And then they realize, you know, concrete changed everything for them, you know, and then they realize that they could harness the sun. So that's the next step, is with using magnifying glass to harness the sun, they can melt, transfer, shape, manipulate any stone material, you know. They melt it with the sun, they capture it, you know what I mean? Because they have molten frickin' stones. But also, not only that, their solar power, the magnifying glass, sped up the concrete drying process. So some of these things that are like built in ungodly timing, like they wrote on this thing that this palace was made in blah 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 time, but that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. Some of them, it's even like, okay, even if it was made of concrete, that doesn't make any sense. It's still too fast. And so, okay, I'm, I'm starting to think that they were, you know, using the sun as a catalyst to, to speed up the concrete process. Because imagine if you could make the stone temples, oh, but we got to wait for all the concrete to dry. <laughs> no, you don't. If you're making the pyramid brick by brick and, and, you know, you have to wait for the concrete to dry, that might be a little, you know, nuts and time consuming. But if you can literally just be like, pour the stuff, dry it, like, pretty much instantly. Yeah. So that's what's cool about this whole thing, is I think where civilization took off is instant concrete. <laughs> we think we have instant concrete today, but we don't harness the sun to dry it instantly. <laughs> I think they went nuts with the whole concrete and the sun, but no, okay, so yeah. And then I think that when the Nile flooded, they decided to leave for those two months. They decided, you know, because it's obviously they had boats and, and stuff like that. There's hieroglyphics everywhere of proof that they had boats and, and they traveled and they did all sorts of stuff. And maybe when they were traveling the world, they, you know, used the sun to protect themselves. <laughs> You know what I mean? A civilization's like, oh my god, there's people coming in boats from the horizon. We should attack them. And they just have a solar ray that comes down. Just boop. And they're just like, nope, we'll level you down with like this laser beam if you guys try to stop us. 
because we're here to share knowledge and we're here to teach you things and you're going to be nice about it because we're here to tell you about the concrete and the and the sun drying process and the, and the whole thing and you're going to listen to us god dang it because if not we're going to laser you down <laughs> you know? i think that because that's sometimes i think about oh if they went to these cultures to try to teach them things like how come those cultures didn't just kill and eat them or, or attack them or anything he's like because you know some of them might have tried <laughs> but it's like if you just have this thing on your on your hat or if you just have somebody carrying one or like maybe it was one of those poles just boop capture the sunlight and melt people so all of a sudden people are listening to what you have to say <laughs> but yeah like i said before is they didn't even have to speak the language they could just show them this is how you do it they form it they use the sun and they walk off long before they discovered a numbering system they started from the simple principle of one to ten by counting their fingers then they counted their toes plus ten and thereby appropriated the numbering system of ten by ten by ten it is the same system that we use today after language, numbering is the second thing humanity learned, long before writing. The numbering system by 10 is for humans the first gateway to scientific understanding of the environment. It is a kind of bridge between the primitive mind and intelligence. The Egyptians observed that the year is made of 365 days plus one. They cut it into three seasons, four months each, for a total of 12 months. The seasons were called flood, germination, and harvest. Over the years, they observed a strange phenomenon. Each year in summer, on a specific day, July 14th, a star, the brightest, rose with the sun, and a few minutes later, it disappeared into the light. The same day, the Nile flooded the fields. The floods were fertile, essential to life, to produce food. Egyptians deified this star and called it Sopdet or Septi. It was the star that announced the floods of the Nile. Today, we call it Sirius. This phenomenon is called the Heliacal Rising of Sirius. It was the first day of the Egyptian year, followed by five holidays. The Nile brought the essential silt for the crops. It is for this reason that this star was sacred to them. The land was flooded for three to four consecutive months. Work in the fields stopped and during this time the Egyptians went up into the hills to be on dry land. Well, it was the start of three months of vacation. And it was like that year after year for thousands of years. But so... That's what this all kind of comes down to, is that the Egyptians learned that the earth was round, and that's why they explored it, or that's why they decided to travel and, and explore, because they realized that if they just followed this star, and if they just went straight, that eventually they could come back to the starting point. And that's why all these megaliths are on this fault line of the earth, because they literally traveled the earth in a line like that, because they were following the star. And it's funny because all those myths about, oh, these tribes... Or, oh, these aliens or these beings that taught us things came from that constellation. And it's funny that they say that they came from that constellation when the Egyptians were traveling based off of that constellation and following that constellation so they could say to those people that they were from there. I mean, or it could just be lost in translation or, you know what I mean? But it's like, it's just a coincidence that they used that to navigate the oceans, but... That's also where the aliens came from and where the pyramids are lined up and, and oh, but you know. Stonehenge in England is one of the most awe-inspiring ancient sites on earth. Even today, its origin and purpose remain shrouded in mystery. One thing they don't know is who built it. There's no doubt the site was the work of some advanced civilization that knew enough about the sun, moon, and stars to align these stones with the heavens in a very specific way. What if I told you we have our very own Stonehenge in the United States? And that it's possible the two sites were built by the same people. Prehistoric site in Salem, New Hampshire. Just like at Stonehenge, someone placed large vertical rocks in a circle. The placement is key. When viewed from the center of the site, each standing stone lines up with the sun on important days of the year. The solstices the longest and shortest days, the equinoxes, when the sun is on a level plane with the Earth's equator, and the cross-quarter days, which fall midway between them. 
this is the uh, summer solstice sunrise stone. So on summer solstice, the sun basically just rises right over there, right over the stone, just kind of comes out diagonal, and then just kind of tracks across the sky. Basically what happens is on summer solstice, the sun will rise right about, right about in the middle here and just kind of go at almost like a perpendicular to where, this, where the stone is and just go right across and just kind of rise up diagonally. Sky. Well, we think actually originally probably was going to be up here. And, you know, over the course of time, it probably moved. Okay, well, if it moved, that's very interesting. You know, we actually had someone come up and check that out. Really? And they, uh, from how far it's moved, they actually dated the site back to about 3,800 years ago. A few months ago, I was on Google Earth, and uh, I was kind of drawing all the lines out on the alignments, just basically to see where they go. As I was drawing one out on the summer solstice sunrise alignment, yeah, I kept taking it out further and further. And then um, as I took it over, I also went right over to England. And I thought that was kind of interesting. So I kept zooming in further and further. And I noticed what through Stonehenge. What? It's going all the way over towards Stonehenge. Not only does it go just through Stonehenge, it actually goes right through one of the trilithons at Stonehenge. Wait a minute. Through one of the trilithons at Stonehenge? That's right. From America's Stonehenge? Then, if you extend that line, it goes to Beirut, Lebanon. A global circle that was not possible to see until we had mapped the entire Earth. Let's go from Easter Island, taking a 30 degree orientation, and draw a line about 100 kilometers wide. The strip passes through Nazca in Peru, then Machu Picchu, Olientay Tambo, Sacsayhuaman, Cusco, and Nopo Iglesia. It crosses the Atlantic to go over the sacred caves at Tassili and Niger in Algeria, then through the oasis of Siwa, by the Giza pyramids in Egypt, over Petra in Jordan, Ur in Iraq, Persepolis in Iran, Mohenjo-Daro in Pakistan, Kajuraho in India, Pye in Burma, Sukhothai in Thailand, Angkor Wat and Priyavir in Cambodia, all highly likely to be connected a long time ago, and then over to the little known islands of Netium in New Caledonia. As incredible as it is, it appears to be there. Let's look at the distance ratio between some of these sites. Let's look at the Earth from above. The red circle that surrounds it is our great circle. The distance between Angkor Wat and Nazca equals the distance between Mohenjo-Daro and Rapa Nui. Angkor Wat to Mohenjo-Daro equals Mohenjo-Daro to Giza, and also Nazca to Rapa Nui. The distance between Angkor Wat and Giza times the golden ratio equals Giza to Nazca and Giza to Nazca times the golden ratio equals the distance between Nazca and Angkor Wat. Using the metric system in the same way we did with the Great Pyramid, let's measure the distance between Easter Island and Giza. 10,000 times the golden ratio, or a quarter of the way around the Earth times the golden ratio. This is where Jim Allison stops, as like many other researchers, they measure distance in miles and not in meters. Up until 2012, Google Earth gave the figure as 16,179 kilometers between both sites. Today, it's 16,168 kilometers. The reason? The method of calculation has changed. So depending on the method used, the result can change. But seriously, even with the difference of about 20 kilometers, to find an island position on this tilted equator is nothing short of a miracle. Okay, so I sort of drew a crappy version of the Earth in the kind of the way that she was talking about because i was trying to see something because i was like you know those dots kind of look specific and it's funny because when she was explaining the distances between them i was like that's kind of interesting so i wanted to double check their stuff because i'm fact checking everybody's everything and i was checking the measurements and then i was checking on chat gpt to see if you know hypothetically if you know measuring the earth with this sort of a method is possible and what the point would be between these equations and these distances and doing these things and if there's a method behind that so i was asking the chatbot all about that i was like could the distances be for you know an algorithm for calculating the earth that we know about or is that a possible way to do it and so okay so i wanted to check the distances real quick right so this is angkor wat mahanjadaro giza rapanui nazca right so 
She says the distance between this one and this one is the same distance from this one to this one. Okay, so from this one to this one. Okay, yeah. And then from this one to this one. Okay, yeah, so that distance measures up. And then she says the distance from this to this, this to this, and this to this is the same. Which is funny because on her model, it looks like this distance is way smaller. You can see that I erased it right here because I originally had it over here because it looked like it was closer in. But then when you when you measure the lines like this one, so you see that's the distance there. You're like, okay, that is equal there and that's equal there. And then I had to remeasure or redraw this dot for that to line up there. So, okay, so the dots are placed correctly, okay? This distance equals this distance equals this distance. That one's the same as that one. Okay, cool. I was thinking that lining up the sun or something with the solstices and like, like I felt like there's something there with navigation. And I thought, it seems like they're calculating the distance around the earth and they're using these sites as markers to do so. And they're just like doing math off of something. Like they're calculating how far they're going in between or something somehow. They're keeping track of the days. And But so chat GPT said something interesting. They said they could use trigonometry to find the calculation of the earth. And which is funny because that should have been obvious to me. And it's funny because there's this whole big debate like, oh, the Egyptians obviously discovered pi because the pyramid is like literally a representation showing that they understood pi and the golden ratio. And it's literally this whole thing. So it's like, and so, yeah, when I asked Chad GPT, they're like, well, whoever did this method would have to have a good understanding of trigonometry. And so it's funny because, okay, so the Egyptians totally did. These are the mysterious Karnak stones located in France. These stones are a collection of gigantic rocks that have been set in place in meticulous and calculated assortments. Some configurations resemble straight lines and rows, while others are circular shapes. The Karnak stones together simulate a series of triangles that make up a complicated mathematical formula, the Pythagorean Theorem. Another appealing issue about the structure of these stones is the very difficult calculations needed to put them in sync to where they are, and just when exactly these stones were assembled. The Karnak stones were made in 3300 BC, which is during the time of the Stone Ages. Pythagoras didn't invent the Pythagorean theorem until 530 BC. It's impossible that the people in the Stone Ages had the competence that was needed to calculate and create the shapes required to execute the Pythagorean Theorem. It's interesting that he said that the people back then, it's impossible that they would have understood the Pythagorean Theorem. When it's like, obviously not. If those exist, then how is that impossible? You know what I mean? Uh, so it obviously wasn't. And, and But, you know, an added thing onto that, another interesting thing, is actually that we actually know that people knew about it that long ago. And we know who knew about it that long ago because of the pyramids. You know, no matter what you choose to believe or no matter what you think or no matter what you want to believe, you know, it's like the pyramids are a physical, literal manifestation of pi and the golden ratio. And it's like literally undebatably like proven that they knew about pi and so and that was about four thousand years ago so yeah so you're looking at proof that it's not impossible uh and there's other reasons that we know it wasn't impossible so yeah somebody did somebody knew about it but but you know what might be impossible that the two civilizations knew it, it that long ago you know what might be impossible that two separate cultures did that and even more unlikely than that, it would, you know, probably be impossible that two different cultures knew it independently. Like, they, they never contacted each other, you know. So, so let's say that it, it is two different cultures or groups of people. It would be miraculous if they came to that conclusion without ever being in contact with each other. So, so that might be impossible, you know. So, it's interesting to think about that, uh, you know. You know what I mean? The Karnak stones are located at the latitude where the sun on winter and summer solstices forms a Pythagorean triangle. And to add to the ridiculousness of, of it not kind of being able to be a coincidence, it's like, you know, people always, like, I don't know how anybody could ever, oh, that just must be a coincidence. Oh, that just must just, oh, 
Just luck of the draw. Just no, they were just randomly put stones. It's just a coincidence that, that it lines up to that. And the shadow that does the solstice thing, that must also just be a giant coincidence. <laughs> no, it's funny because it's like, okay, so when you think about, oh, the Karnak stone mystery, oh, they're, they show proof of the Pythagorean theorem. And it shows proof of astronomy because it lines up with this thing on the solstice. And it's like, oh, that's so funny because both of those phenomenons that are very well known are also in so many other places. But it's like, but yeah, it all, it all goes back to Egypt. Not only is it everywhere, but Egypt also. It's like, oh, it's funny because in Egypt, not only was it, did they know about the Pythagorean theorem around that time, but they could also do the sun solstice things. And they built monuments to reflect the solstices. And so that's a weird coincidence, right? It's more believable that aliens came down here than the Egyptians just traveled the world. It's more likely that they invented acoustic levitation technology or magnetic levitation before they just explored the world. And all of these things, it's like, when I say that this is the proof, it's like, you know what I mean, though? Because I said they were making points around a circle on a certain point. What would be the point of that? And they said if they made any triangles, then they would calculate the triangles. And it's funny because that's when I started to think about these lines. And this is where it gets weird. Because, yeah, look at these lines, right? These are the lines that they use to calculate around the Earth, you know, as far as the theory goes or whatever. But so check this out. There's a triangle right here. Okay. That's one way they could calculate. Oh, that's one equation. But just for, for clarity, make sure that we get the calculation of the Earth right. Let's make sure that we have several triangles. Because there's a triangle right here. There's a triangle. And then, uh, here's a triangle. Here's a triangle. Oh, here's a triangle. So you see something weird happening? So in Hinduism, in, or just mathematics, or just, you know, in all sorts of things, you know, you see stuff that looks just like this. And it's funny because she was talking about Easter Island and how the volcanoes and everything and the monument was lined up to make a sacred pentagram. And it's funny because when I was making this circle, I thought this is a star. And I thought, oh, it's interesting that it's a star. But then when it had this, you know, when you make these triangles also, and it starts to square off, that's where it gets a little extra weird. You know what I mean? Because... Yeah, I probably haven't even drawn all the triangles or whatever. I mean, I might have. I really don't know. I, I stopped paying attention. But, like, I don't even know if the people on the show that were literally doing this even realized that this was this pattern. Because, uh, yeah. They were literally talking about how Easter Island made this pattern. And then they were talking about this shape. They were literally talking about a star with a triangle flat piece under it as a, as a golden ratio kind of equation symbol. And they don't even realize that the alignments of where these things are that they showed me make this pattern when you do the calculations that the computer told me that they would be doing. It literally just said these are the distances that they'd be measuring. So, you know, if they had a map or a diagram, like let's say they knew about painting or, or something and they were able to draw a circular Earth and they had a plan to travel the Earth and they were just like, okay, we're going to travel in a circle. And let's say they mapped it out and they did equations and they they would have seen and known about this symbol. And that it would have came from that. You know what I mean? This symbol would have came from that. And you know what? Did I find out that it looks wrong and redraw it out? Of course. I know it looks wrong on this thing, okay? But you know what? Okay, so I, d I went back and I redrew it, okay? And so, does it look more like this? Yeah, sure. But you know what? In my defense, it's pretty much the same thing. Yeah, sure, it's a little bit more intense the other way. But you know what? This is still the same thing. <laughs> yeah, the shape is still there. It's still the same thing. I'm sure that this is what, you know, the other one is what they were going for. But you know what? They couldn't really make the other one because of the ocean and the water. And there's water in the way of that. But this is close enough. And you know what? It doesn't even matter either way. That was just an added little kind of bonus thing or whatever. A little interesting trippy thing. Once we check the distance on site with the maps application for smartphones and taking the GPS coordinates of the Great Pyramid in Giza as the starting point, we were able to validate a new discovery by Jim Allison. The point indicating precisely the 16,180 kilometers is located at the center of the triangle created by three remarkable points of this island. The two highest summits, Terra Vaca and Poike, and the center of the crater at Ranokeo. And this triangle is even more unique. It is the portion of the golden pentagon connected to the golden ratio. 
How can you explain the distance between the sites being anything but deliberate? The answer is clear. The builders of Giza had to position the site according to Easter Island, which they must have known about, same as the metric system. So the Egyptians totally invented the meter, and I'm going to prove that. But yeah, really quick. Before we get involved with the meter thing and before we go down that path, I want to just backtrack super quick. So we looked at all the sun places and, I, and we were talking about the sun and, and how they're obsessed with it. But so really quickly, I just want to give you a rundown. Like here's a list of, of places. Most of these places I'm pretty sure we haven't mentioned. Just listen to the sun places all over the world from ancient times because I threw together a list and it's stuff that wasn't on the other lists so and you'll understand what I mean by they were obsessed with the sun when you hear this and there's too much on the list I didn't align it I wanted to put pictures like every time but no okay I've already done too much and there's so many things on this list so just listen to the thing okay Teotihuacan this ancient city in Mexico is known for its massive pyramids including the pyramid of the sun and the pyramid of the moon Machu Picchu this Incan city in Peru was built on a mountain ridge and is thought to have been a religious center the Intihuatana Stone, which means hitching post of the sun, is believed to have been used for astronomical observations and sun worship. Heliopolis, this ancient city in Egypt, was dedicated to the worship of the sun god Ra. It was home to several temples and obelisks, including the famous obelisk of Heliopolis. Stonehenge, this prehistoric site in England is believed to have been used for astronomical observations and may have been associated with sun worship. The monument includes several large stones arranged in a circle, as well as a central stone known as the heel stone that aligns with the sunrise on the summer solstice. Abu Simbel, these two massive temples in Egypt were built by the pharaoh Ramesses II and are dedicated to the gods Amun and Ra Harakti. The temple of Ra Harakti is oriented so that the sun shines directly on the statues inside on two days of the year. Chichen Itza. This ancient city in Mexico is known for its large pyramid, known as El Castillo, which has four staircases with 91 steps each, plus one additional step at the top. When you add up all the steps in the top platform, it equals 365, the number of days in the solar year. Tiwanaku. This ancient city in Bolivia is known for its massive stone structures, including the Acapana Pyramid and the Sun Gate. The Sun Gate features a carved representation of the sun, as well as other astronomical symbols. Gossic Circle. This circular ditch and bank earthwork in Germany is believed to have been a Neolithic solar observatory. It is aligned with the winter solstice, sunrise, and sunset. Temple of the Sun, Sipan. This ancient Mochi temple in Peru was discovered in the 1980s and is believed to have been a place of ritual sacrifice. It features murals and artifacts depicting the sun god. Kokino. This ancient observatory in North Macedonia is believed to have been used for astronomical observations, including the tracking of the sun and moon. It features several stone markers aligned with the sunrise and sunset on the summer and winter solstices. Glastonbury Tor. This hill in England is believed to have been a site of ritual importance for thousands of years. It is crowned by the ruins of St. Michael's Church, which is thought to have been built on the site of a much older pagan temple associated with the sun. Sun Temple of Konark. This 13th century temple in India is dedicated to the sun god Surya. It is designed in the shape of a chariot with 24 wheels, each representing an hour of the day. Puma Punku. This ancient site in Bolivia is believed to have been a part of the larger Tiwanaku complex. It features massive stone blocks that were cut and shaped with incredible precision, and some of these blocks are thought to have been used for astronomical observations and sun worship. Tulum. This ancient Mayan city in Mexico is known for its beachfront location and impressive ruins. The Temple of the Frescoes, which features murals depicting the sun god, is thought to have been a place of worship. Bighorn Medicine Wheel. This prehistoric site in Wyoming, USA, features a large circle of stones with several spokes radiating outward. It is believed to have been used for astronomical observations and sun worship by the Plains Indians who lived in the region. Xochicolco, this ancient city in Mexico is believed to have been a center of astronomical and religious knowledge. Its main temple is oriented to the rising and setting sun on the equinoxes. Cusco, this ancient city in Peru was the capital of the Incan Empire and is believed to have been a center of sun worship. The Corajancha Temple, dedicated to the sun god Inti, was said to be covered in gold and housed a golden statue of the sun. Grianan of Ailich, this ancient stone fort in Ireland is believed to have been a ceremonial site associated with the sun. It is aligned with the sunrise on the summer solstice. Cahokia, this ancient city in Illinois, USA, was the largest pre-Columbian settlement north of Mexico. Its central mound, known as Monk's Mound, is oriented to the sunrise on the summer solstice. Tulum, this ancient city in Turkey is believed to have been a center of sun worship. Its main temple is oriented to the sunrise on the winter solstice. Chan Chan, this ancient city in Peru was the capital of the Chimu Empire and is believed to have been a center of sun worship. Its main temple, the Temple of the Sun, featured a large golden disc that reflected the sun's rays. Sun Temple, Madhara, this 11th century temple in India is dedicated to the sun god Surya. It is designed in the shape of a mandala and features intricate carvings and sculptures. The Sun Gate, this ancient stone gateway in Bolivia is believed to have been a part of the Tiwanaku complex. It features carvings of sun gods and was likely a part of a larger ritual complex. Sun Temple of Ramses II, this ancient temple in Egypt was dedicated to the worship of the sun god Ra. It features a large statue of Ramses II and is known for its impressive astronomical alignments. Sun Pyramid, this ancient pyramid in Mexico is believed to have been a center of sun worship. Its main temple features carvings and murals depicting the sun god. Hohokam Solar Observatory, this prehistoric site in Arizona, USA, features a series of walls and pits that were likely used for astronomical observations and sun worship by the Hohokam people. Sun Temple, Martand, this ancient temple in India was dedicated to the sun god Surya. It was built in the 8th century and is known for its impressive architecture. Sun Dagger, this ancient rock art site in New Mexico, USA, features a series of petroglyphs and carved grooves that align with the sunrise on the summer solstice. Temple of the Sun, Palenque, this ancient temple in Mexico is believed to have been a center of sun worship. It features a large statue of the sun god and is known for its impressive architecture. Sunken Temple of Kanat Bakish, this ancient temple in Lebanon is believed to have been dedicated to the sun god. It is located underground and features a series of chambers and passageways. These solstice aligned sites can be found on all continents. These sites are often associated with ancient cultures that had a strong connection to the natural world and the cycles of the sun and stars. So it's like, okay, so there's sun places everywhere. So that was kind of ridiculous. 
And then, and then you know what I what I asked after that? I said, "Oh, it's interesting that it seems like every monument or like every place ever or like something like has something to do with the sun." And so I said, "Do any of the American monuments have any sun imagery? Cuz like we have that big statue of Lincoln in the chair, right? We have like Mount Rushmore, right? We have like all sorts of random little monuments and sure maybe they're not that old. I mean, they're old, but like they're not thousands, thousands of years old. But so I asked, is there any American monuments or famous things that have any sun imagery? And you know what they said? The answer is yes, literally all of them. And when I say literally all of them, so yeah, it, might, it could be a coincidence up until a certain point or whatever. And maybe all these places all over the world are just, you know, sure, maybe those are all weird coincidences or whatever. But then when you think about every single one of our monuments has sun imagery. You're like, well, why do all of them, though? How come literally all of them? And it's like, it's, it's always something little. Like, most of these monuments have, like, buildings or museums attached to them. Like the big Lincoln Monument thing. That doesn't have a sun on it, but apparently the building next to it, like, you go in and there's a sun mural on the ceiling. And so it's like, it's always something like that. Or, like, the Statue of Liberty has, like, a solar crown, Right. And so it's like, you don't really think too much of that. And it's like, oh, sure, cool, well, whatever. Yeah, everybody has a solar crown. Deities have halos or whatever, remember? So, but then you listen to, like, literally all of them, and it gets a little weird. The Great Seal features an eagle with outstretched wings, clutching an olive branch and arrows in its talons. Above the eagle's head is a radiant sun with 13 rays. Lady Liberty's crown features seven rays representing the seven continents of the world, with the sun's rays emanating from behind her head. The Lincoln Memorial features a mural depicting an allegory of George Washington flanked by two women representing liberty and victory. Above the women is a sunburst. The interior of the Jefferson Memorial features a bronze statue of Thomas Jefferson, surrounded by 26 columns, each with a carved image of a sunrise. The dome of the U.S. Capitol building features an oculus, or circular opening that allows sunlight to enter the building. The oculus is surrounded by a series of suns and stars. The west facade of the Supreme Court building features a sculptural group entitled, The Authority of Law. At the top of this sculptural group is a group of figures holding a radiant sunburst. The National Archives building features a sculpture entitled, The Constitution, above its entrance. The sculpture features a radiant sunburst. The National Museum of Natural History features a rotunda with a skylight at its center, allowing natural light to enter the museum. The skylight is surrounded by a series of suns and stars. The U.S. Department of Agriculture building features a bronze sculpture entitled, The Agriculture Group, above its entrance. The sculpture features a group of figures holding a sunburst. The National Air and Space Museum features a mural entitled, The History of Aviation, that depicts a series of airplanes and spaceships flying toward a radiant sun. The Library of Congress features a series of murals entitled, The Evolution of Civilization, that depict the history of human progress. One of the murals features a radiant sunburst. The Betsy Ross House in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, is the historic site where Betsy Ross allegedly sewed the first American flag. The house features a weather vane on its rooftop in the shape of a radiant sunburst. The National World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. features a series of bronze wreaths surrounding its central fountain. Each wreath is surrounded by a series of rays. The James A. Garfield Monument in Cleveland, Ohio, features a bronze statue of the 20th President of the United States surrounded by a series of sunbursts. The Soldiers and Sailors Monument in Indianapolis, Indiana, features a bronze statue of victory holding a sunburst. The Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial in Washington, D.C. features a series of four outdoor rooms, each dedicated to a specific term of Roosevelt's presidency. The first room features a bronze statue of Roosevelt surrounded by a series of suns and stars. The Washington Monument is an obelisk that features a pyramidion at its top. The pyramidion is made of aluminum, which was a precious metal at the time of the monument's construction. The pyramidion also includes a lightning rod and a capstone, which is inscribed with the Latin words, Laus Deo, meaning, praise be to God. So the Egyptians totally invented the meter, and I'm going to prove that. You don't know what's possible.